Welcome everybody. We are in a series here entitled With. It's a relationship series that I've had so much fun walking through every single week. We've talked about marriages. We've talked about friends. We've talked about families. We've talked about topics of forgiveness and vulnerability. And I want to continue that conversation today just one click further. But before we get any further, I want to make sure that we give a nice, big, warm welcome to all of our participators who are online today, wherever you're watching from. We celebrate you. We celebrate you. I want to talk to you from Ephesians 6, verses 16 through 18. We picked up here last week, and we only got halfway done with this particular passage, so we're going to finish it up today. Ephesians 6, 16 through 18 says this. In addition to all this, for context, Paul says there are things that I've already talked about, which are the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and the shoes, which are the readiness and the preparation of the gospel. And he looks at all that as he's staring at different Roman soldiers, and he says, in addition to all this, everything I said was not enough. There's more that you need to have. So he says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. I do not like to fight. It is not in my DNA or part of my personality to start a fight, to pick a fight, or to fight in general. I was only ever in one fight growing up, and I lost. There was one punch thrown on the school bus. It was not my punch. It was the one that squared me right in the nose, and the fight was over. However, I do like the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Uh, particularly, I'm quite fond of Conor McGregor. He's, um, he's a bit obnoxious. He's rather great entertainer, and I just enjoy watching these guys. And they do like to fight. For whatever reason, they enjoy that. And they know that when they step in the ring, there's going to be an opponent who is in the ring with them, ready to make their face look like pulp. Their knuckles are going to be totally pulverized, and they're, they're, they're going to be bedridden for about a week after this whole thing's done. They love it. I don't know why, but they do. But every time I watch the post-game interview of a fighter, the fighter that loses, he never really talks about all of the tactics of his opponent. When he talks about why he lost, he always talks about himself. And he says, I just wasn't prepared mentally for the fight. I didn't have the right mindset when I went into the ring. I didn't execute well enough. I didn't prepare strong enough, and I don't feel like I did the best job I could have done. Oh, I, I'm not taking anything away from him, but I believe that I could win that fight if I did the things I was supposed to do all over again. I need to re-prep my mind for the fight that I'm running into next. I've talked a lot about relationships with all kinds of people today. I want to hub this whole conversation on one relationship we have not talked about. I want to talk about your relationship with you. I want to talk about you. I want to get all up in your mind. I want to talk about you. You. I, 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 just, just, just ask me this question to yourself out loud. How's my relationship with me? Go ahead. We're going to get this participation culture right one of these days. Let's try again. Wait, wait, wait. Vigor, how's my relationship with me? Online, you're not outside of this. You're participating too. You can drop that right there. Take notes now. Make sure you, you get it all in your system. Uh, this is one you're going to want to take notes on so that you can go back to it throughout the week because I believe your relationship with you 
is insanely important because there is a real fight that you are in right now, whether you have acknowledged it or not. And every time that you're going to go through this fight, any time that you win or any time that you fail, you're, you know that you're going to take some sort of assessment on the victories or the defeats of life and try to figure out how you can do it better next time. And what Paul is trying to say right here is that the way that you think about the fight of your life really, really matters. He's talking about your relationship with you. So he says that we have to have four things. We have to have the helmet of salvation. We have to have the shield of faith. We have to have the sword of the spirit. We have to pray in the spirit on all occasions. I want to start with the helmet of salvation. Let me grab a helmet just to illustrate this to the best of my ability. He says you got to put on the helmet of salvation. We're going to put this thing on today, and let's make sure our priorities are straight because the most important thing is that my hair looks good when I take this off in a minute. It survived first service. Oh, yeah. I got more product in there than half the women in this joint. (laughs) Let me just tell you. I'm ready. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he says you got to put on the helmet of salvation. What, what is the helmet of salvation? What is that? Well, the, your mind is, is, is where you, all thoughts are housed. Every thought that's happening right now, you have, you have good thoughts, you have bad thoughts, you have thoughts that don't feel like yours, you have, you have thoughts that are just waging all the time. And he says that we have to be saved and put on and take up the helmet of salvation so that our head is covered. Peter says it this way in one of his letters to the church. He says, I have written you these things to remind you that you should be stimulated to wholesome thinking. That, that, that you should be stimulated to wholesome thinking. And I want to preach and I want to elevate to you that every time we preach, it's to stimulate you back to wholesome thinking, to get your mind right, to get you ready for the fight so that you can go out in life and that you can win the war that you face with the enemy. And there is a real enemy who is after all of us, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy anything he can in our lives. And when we take on the helmet of salvation, it's you literally thinking every day, I was saved from the trap that was set for me. That's what salvation is. And I was rescued for the traps that the enemy set before me. I am saved today from every trap that the enemy tries to set for me today. And I will be saved when I feel trapped by the traps that the enemy tries to set before me, and when I put on the helmet of salvation, I'm never trapped. You don't have to live trapped and confined. You can change the pattern of your thinking when you put on the helmet of salvation and you pray and you receive what we call the mind of Christ and you think on the things that are not of the enemy. This is what Romans 12, 2 says. It says, do not conform to the pattern of thinking of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you put this on, I'm renewed today. I'm thinking different thoughts today. I am a sharper leader because I have the presence of God in my life. I am a better husband because I have the spirit of Christ in my heart. I'm a better father because Jesus shows me the way to parent children. And when I declare these things out loud, I've put on the helmet of salvation. And the more I think this way, then the more I actually live this way in life. Am I making sense? You have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's so important. Back in the Old Testament when they would anoint certain leaders, they anointed David. It was a symbol of the presence of God coming onto his life and and covering him and coating him. And they anointed from the head down. They didn't anoint his hands. They didn't anoint his feet. They anointed his head. And from the head, the oil flowed down to represent that I'm fully covered, I'm fully protected, and I'm listening to my father. I love this analogy to illustrate what happens when we come into a salvific relationship with Jesus. 
the NFL quarterbacks back in the 90s, they decided to put a communication device inside the helmet of the quarterbacks. And the quarterback, as he's looking at the opponent on the field and he's trying to survey the play that the defense is going to run at him, he has a better vantage point in his coach. And his coach, who's sitting up in the booth, has oversight. And because he has oversight, he sees things that the quarterback does not see. And because the coach sees things that the quarterback cannot see, they said we ought, to, we ought to implement something inside this helmet so that we can help our quarterbacks call the right plays to prevent all the tackling and win the game. So they implanted these speakers inside the QB's helmet so that the coach can talk to the QB in real time so that the QB can then tell the players how they should run the play. If you're not picking up on this analogy right now, You have speakers in your head and there is a God in heaven who has oversight in your life seeing plays that you can't see. And when you take on the helmet of salvation and you say, I am saved, I will be saved, and I was saved, then you are going, God, show me the play I'm supposed to run today. I'm listening to you and I don't want you just to pray and say words out loud. I want you to pray until you hear from God. And when you hear from God, you, you realize this is the way I should go. That's the helmet of salvation. Everything flows from the head down in your life. Proverbs says, as a man thinketh, so shall he be. You, you, you know the way to quit thinking about something? Stop talking about it. We, we talk about all kinds of things, and we're like, I just can't stop thinking about that. You won't stop talking about it either. And the more that you keep talking about and complaining and negativity and the problem and the, and the issue and the thing and all that, and you just don't have the fortitude to go fix it, just fix it. And the way that we stop thinking the wrong things is stop talking about the wrong things. It's connected. So when you think these things, stop saying, I'm a bad husband. Stop saying, I'm a poor wife. Stop saying, I'm not a good dad. You say to yourself, I am a good dad. I am a good husband. Are you following me? And it changes and renews the way that you think because there's a war where arrows are flying at you all the time. Arrows in this context, these are literal thoughts that are not your own. Did we, did we survive? Does it look okay? Is it Cowlick? Thumbs up? Five of y'all. The other is like, eh, I'm not going to tell them the truth. <laughs> so <clears throat> arrows, what does it say? That we should take up the shield of faith to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Paul, what are you talking about? Like what, what in the world is happening right here? I don't understand. What are the, the flaming arrows of the evil one? Cut to the chase, I'll skip the analogy, I'll come back and I'll illustrate best I can. These are the literal thoughts that set your life off to the wrong track. Thoughts in your mind about who you are, about what you do, and about where you should go that are influenced negatively by the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So the way that we stop those things is we choose to think different things in ourselves. Listen, you know the moments that you've been tempted with something and on the other side of temptation that you cave to, you have a conversation with somebody, a friend, a family member, and you say, I just don't know why I did that. You never say, I don't know why the enemy tempted me with that. You always say, I don't know why I followed through on that. I knew better than that. I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. I knew I wasn't supposed to look at that. I knew I wasn't supposed to go there. I knew that wasn't. What are you doing? You're just like the fighter in the ring saying, oh, yeah, the opponent has all kinds of tactics, but I know how to execute. I know how the the right way is to live. Well, what got you through the temptation was the flaming arrows of the evil one who was trying to tempt you into places, but I want to talk about your relationship with you now so that you can prevent yourself from having to follow through on those activities that you shouldn't be doing anyway that you know you don't want to do, but you continually keep on doing. This is a daily message that we have to constantly live out. And as Paul's looking at these Roman soldiers, he realizes they have this giant shield. It's two and a half feet wide by four feet tall. Let me just bring a shield out for illustrative purposes today. 
Oh, yeah, look at my shield here. Yeah, yeah, this is sexy. Yeah, yeah, this is nice. This is good. Don't you like it? So this is exact replica of what they had back in the day. <laughs> so the shield of faith, you're not going to go literally take up a shield tomorrow when you wake up. You're not going to go take it up and, and go find some shield. But metaphorically, he was saying that your faith acts like a shield. Now, the shield that he was looking at, it it was thick with wood and it was bound with leather. And what they would do is they, they would actually soak that shield down with water before they would go into battle. They'd saturate it, make sure that it was, it was completely filled with water so that when these arrows that archers would light on fire would be thrown at them, it would hit the shield. But because it was made of wood and because it had water on it, the flames wouldn't burn the shield. Your faith has to be saturated in the, in the presence of God. Your faith can't get dry. Anytime that we see water in Scripture, what Paul's trying to do in a metaphor is say that water resembles the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is the faith that you have and you are praying constantly and taking your faith to him, that it's wetting your shield. Because there's a lot of people who will put their faith in what I call dry shields. Dry shields will be self-help books personality tests, new age thinking, just positive tests of, of personality and going, I, I, I'm going to think positive things and be positive and it's going gonna, it's gonna to work for me. Until you see those same people who are negative three months later and you're like, what happened to the, the positivity talk? Yeah, well, the flaming arrows of the evil one hit the dry shield that had no Jesus on it and that shield disintegrated because their faith was in some sort of the power of positivity and that doesn't last. That doesn't work. But when you have a relationship with Jesus and you put your faith in something it's it's so wet that the the arrows when they when they try to come they will not burn your faith to the ground the shield though it's it's amazing to me as i think through the arrows and what this looks like that faith i choose to see faith in my life by faith i see miracles by faith i believe the best is yet to come by faith, I believe my future is better than my past. See, the arrows re resemble things that are opposite of faith, like doubt. I doubt that my future will be better than my past. I doubt that the best really is yet to come. I doubt what is ahead of me is from God. This is the influence thinking of the enemy that's literally trying to take your life off course. You have to catch that stuff, and you have to say, no, 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 but by faith, I don't receive the arrow of doubt, and I choose to follow Christ and feel what he's going to give me in my future. And I love this because it says we walk by faith. Same author, we walk by faith and not by sight. And it's a shield. And the shield's so tall, I can't see on the other side. Fletch, will you give me a little help here? Let me show you this. See, faith, I can't see him right now. You can see him, but I can't see him right now. All I'm looking at is the back of my shield of faith and the enemy on the other side of your shield. Maybe I just will submit to you, you don't need to see him. If you could see into the future, you'd be scared to death. This is why Paul says, just take that shield up. Just work that elbow out and we walk by faith not by sight. And if I walk by faith, I end up pushing the enemy back to wherever he came from because I don't need to see him. I just need to believe that the best is yet to come, that by faith I believe my miracle is on the way. Am I making sense today? It's a great place to put your hands together. You walk by faith. But the arrows of the enemy are, I mean, he's, 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 he's a crafty, crafty guy he's an archer as they would call him the arrows of the enemy so it must be that he has some sort of archery skills well archers actually have something in common with snakes because he was a serpent in the garden of eden and that's what they called him then and i got to thinking about this and i said well why would why would paul why would Paul call him an archer that he has flaming arrows? What, 
What's the correlation? I began to think, and I began to think some more, and I decided to think about that thing. <laughs> and I started to do some study. You know that snakes don't have eyelids? They, don't, they can't blink. This is him right here. Oh, I know, it's spooky, isn't it? <laughs> this is him right here. He just doesn't blink. He just doesn't blink. The enemy doesn't, doesn't have eyelids, a snake. I was watching the Discovery Channel, and there was this, this gal on there who owned a snake. And she said something, something happened to her snake. It, it quit eating, and she couldn't figure out why. And the more that she tried to feed it, it was this big old python. The, the less it would eat until eventually it just quit. And she noticed that his, his behavior began to change. And every morning that she would wake up, he had started a new pattern where he would be laying in the bed next to her, all stretched out. And so she decided something's wrong with my snake. My snake's just going crazy. So she said, I probably need to take my snake to the vet. She goes and takes the snake to the vet and says, hey, my snake's not eating. And, he's, and, and I don't know why. And I'm afraid he's going to die. And he's a little sick. And uh, and every morning I wake up, there he is, and he's stretched out in the bed right next to me. And so the, they, they decide to run some tests on the snake. And as they run the test on the snake, he comes back to her and he says, well, I've got two reports for you. i got some good news and i got some bad news. The good news is, from a health perspective, your snake is perfectly fine. The bad news is, the reason that your snake has stopped eating is because he is now sizing you up, and you are his next meal. This is the way the enemy works. He waits, he watches, and he chooses the point when you're most vulnerable to attack. You know what an archer does in hiding? An archer has to wait, has to watch, and find the point at which you're most vulnerable to let that arrow fly. It's, it's the same exact thing that your enemy is waiting and is watching until you are in a place where you let your guard down. And that shield falls a little bit and then the arrow flies. You know the scariest part about this whole analogy Paul's using to me? Is I wish it was flaming bullets because at least I can hear it when a gun goes off. But you can't, you can't hear an arrow leave the bowstring. He waits, he watches, and he attacks silently. You know when you hear the arrow? You hear it when it hits. And when the arrow finally hits you, it's too late. You don't hear about your friends and their marriage until you hear about the divorce. The arrow hit them, and it was too late. You don't hear about pastors and their moral failures before the failure happens. The arrow was pulled back, and I'm sick and tired of people bottling things up and not actually talking about what's going on because once the arrow hits, it's too late. It's too late. And I don't want to make you afraid. That's not my aim today. But I want to let you know, we're all in the crosshairs right now. We're all in the crosshairs right now, waiting, watching, watching and that bow is pulled back. It's tight as it can be because the enemy will do anything he can to steal your joy, to kill you and take you out, to destroy your life. That is his aim. And I don't want you to be afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm aware. I'm aware that his, his activity is around me, but I'm not afraid of him. You don't have to be afraid of him. And what I want you to do, since you can't hear it, you have to be able to sense the shot before it comes. When you can sense the shot, I need to know that you know yourself better than everybody in this, this room. You know the points in your life when your energy is low, when you are most vulnerable, those late nights when all the family's going to bed and you should not be up late at night doing whatever it is you're doing. He's watching, he's waiting, and you should be able to sense the shot. You should be aware, not afraid of him, but you should be able to sense the shot. Know yourself better to understand when you are most vulnerable because I promise you, you'll hear it when it hits. And when it hits, it's too late. So you have to anticipate these attacks. Know thyself best to know all the moments that the enemy is going to try to creep into your life. And when I take up the shield of faith, I consciously decide 
to block every shot that comes my way. I continually say, no, no, no. By faith and for faith and in my faith with Jesus, I'm better than that. This is a relationship with me that I need to figure out. I need to choose consciously to live by faith and don't let the arrow of sin hit my life. And when I choose to think this way, being renewed by my mind, I start to behave like this in my life. I'm making sense. How's your relationship with you? How's your prayer life going? How's, how's the time spent in scripture? How's all these things culminating to you winning the fight of your life? I know this message is not the sexiest that anyone ever heard because this is the deep discipleship stuff that no one wants to elevate to our awareness level so that we can actually go out and face and win the fight. You know why I don't think that you should be afraid of him? Because you've been given a sword. He says, he says that by the time I'm done with all of you, you're, you're going to have the belt of truth, the blessed breastplate of righteousness. Your feet are going to be shod with the preparation of the gospel. You're going to have the helmet of salvation. You're going to have the shield of faith. You're going to have the sword of the spirit. You're going to look like a spiritual armadillo. Just, just, just armored up, baby. Just, 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 woo! Come at me now, brother. Come on. You've been given the sword of the spirit. What is that? He said that's the word of God. Now, the word of God, twofold, is yes, it is Bible. And I want you to memorize as many scriptures as you can so that when you get into a fight that you can actually recall from memory the scriptures that you need in the midst of the temptation and the fight of your life. But it's also meaning when Paul's writing this, the active revelation of God. The Greek says it, it's a rhema word. Rhema means right now God speaks, I listen, and as, as the coach talks to the QB, I can speak that out into existence, and this is how I fight the enemy off of my life. Praying with all kinds of requests, praying all the time for all kinds of things. That's what it says. But I want to just point out, I started to study it and go, the enemy has a bow and we have a sword. That doesn't seem fair. The enemy has a bow, but we have been given a sword. I said, God, why is that? Why, why would we have swords to fight with against a guy who has a better vantage point than I do? He's... He's long distance. And he said, well, you got to remember, this is not actually happening out there on the battlefield. It's the battlefield of your mind. It's the battlefield of your mind. And then I started to realize, you know, I said, I'm aware. I'm not afraid. We just said that I'm, I'm aware of his activity. I'm not afraid. Can I show you that? I'm aware. I'm not afraid. I think we got a slide that says, I'm aware, I'm not afraid. <laughs> but I want you to see it change the tense. I'm aware, I'm not afraid. Oh, I'm aware that I'm not afraid. I'm aware that I'm not afraid of him. I'm aware he's there, but I'm also aware I'm not afraid. Why? Why would this be the tense that we have to take when we're talking about taking up the sword of the Spirit? Because maybe, just maybe, it's him who's at a long-range vantage point because he's the one who's scared of you. He doesn't want to get close to you. He doesn't want to have hand-to-hand -hand combat with you because Jesus, who lives in you, already had hand-to-hand -hand combat with him. When he was raised from the grave, he went to hell itself and fought the enemy. And that power that conquered death, hell, and the grave now lives in us. And so why have we been given the sword of the Spirit? Because this speaks to you having to be a person of confrontation. As soon as those thoughts arise in your mind, you confront 
with those suckers. He's going to fire them from afar, and you go right into them. Stop avoiding all those things that you don't want to think about. Quit ignoring all those things that make you uncomfortable. The way you keep losing the fight is by ignoring it, avoiding it, and pretending that it's not there. You get confrontational, and you go head on. You look that snake in the eyes, and you slay the belly of that beast. Are you feeling me? Every thought, every thought should be, oh, that came from you. You Get get thee behind me, Satan. I'm coming right after you. Look at me in my eyes. Because I'm going to confront those things that you're trying to take me out on. I've got faith in one hand. I've got sword in the other hand. I'm saved by, by grace. Listen to this. That we are to confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord and then you will be saved. This is Romans and Ephesians going hand in hand. By faith, I push him back, and then I confront those negative thoughts he sends my way, and then I replace those things with what God says about me, the truth of who I actually am. This happened to me yesterday. God said, Alan, you've got to live this message before you preach this message. So yesterday, honestly... I woke up and I just felt off. You know those days you wake up and you're like, "Ah, something's something's just not right. I felt like I was under attack, but I didn't realize it at the time. I was doing a really bad job. I wasn't sensing the shot. My mood was off. And so I go to pray and I'm not kidding. I'm just kind of dragging around in prayer and I was going, (sighs) I felt like getting these thoughts. This sermon's a total waste of your church's time. The sermon's not good. Your illustrations suck. You're just a scattered mess. You're just going to get up there and flail around tomorrow. Do you understand how important this moment is to me? I take this stuff seriously. I'm constantly thinking about what God would want to say to our church. I want you to know that. That's heartfelt. That's the real deal saying that I know what hangs in the balance every Sunday morning that we gather together of people's marriages, their hearts, their their lives, their children, their futures. I'll do anything short of sin to get somebody closer to Christ. And so this stuff is so important. It matters to me. And I'm pacing yesterday. It's like, oh, man, I don't even want to go tomorrow. It's just me. And I felt like God started to speak into it. This went on for 20 minutes. And I felt like the Lord said, Alan, got to live this sermon today so that you can preach this sermon tomorrow. Who's talking to you right now? Whose voice are you entertaining right now? Is it my voice telling you that you're wasting the church's time? Is it my voice telling you that you're a scattered mess? Is it my voice telling you that the sermon's not right? And all of a sudden, I started to tune in to my coach's voice, and I started to realize wait a second, I'm listening to the wrong person right now. I'm being influenced by the wrong thoughts. And he said, so take your faith, confront him right now, and say what's actually happening. And I bet God just started to speak to me, and I felt like God said, this is the right moment. This is the right church. This is the right message for you. And then he said, Alan, you got to start believing it. By faith, I believe that God has spoken to me to deliver a message to these people at 9 a.m. and 1045 on Sunday, March the 14th. That God is that sovereign. That God, you are that big. God, I believe by faith, I confront everything that is so tangling me up. And I know that my God, who's so providential, who's the God of the universe, probably knows every situation happening in every single person who calls this church home or who's visiting for the first time. And God, I believe by faith that this is the message, this is the moment, this is the time that I should come and deliver this and I'll let the results be up to you. That's how you fight this week right there. I'm not any different than you. We're all in it. But you have to consciously choose which way you're gonna go. You have to decide Am I going to go left? And I'm going to follow all the arrows that are pounding against my mind right now? Or am I going into the fray? And I'm going to fight with this weapon in my hand. God, I believe by faith 
Lord, that you have called me, that you've chosen me, that you've appointed me, that you've anointed me to be the person you've asked me to be. And because of that, I'm, I'm prepared for it. This is how we daily do this within ourselves. And that war, I know, is, is waging in as many heads as there are people in this room. This is also why you should be in a small group. Can I show you a couple more things? You got to get in a small group. It doesn't have to be mine, but I'd like for you to get in one. Because Paul, he said that there's these, these soldiers he's looking at, and they had this unique tactic where they would create a phalanx. And that's a weird word, but it meant like this giant shield wall. And they would create this huge dome of shields so that they could be protected from the enemy together. Did you see the movie 300? Yeah, you did. It was the coolest movie of all time. You know, when they, when they got all their shields together and they made this giant, this giant dome of shields to protect themselves, yeah, yeah, that's it right there. <laughs> Paul, let, let's get some gentlemen on stage with me too to illustrate this one step further. They, they actually created this, and what Paul's saying is as he's looking at all the analogies, he's saying, you, you, gotta, you can't just be a, a lone ranger. You can't just be a... A, 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 a solo artist in this thing called faith. You got to get you, go ahead, step right in front of me. Yeah, yeah, we're going we're gonna to preach from behind the illustration today. He said, you got to be protected on your front, on your back, on all sides, over your head, and that when we lock arms together as people, that even if we turn, that we are showing everybody that, that, that we have locked ourselves up, that there's no place, that I have vulnerability, that I have great people to my left. I have great people to my life. Why? Because when I can't sense the shot, I need a small group to help show me the shot. That people can look into my eyes and say, Alan, you don't look right today. Your mood's off today. You don't seem right today. Your general disposition needs work, son. We need to talk to you and say, Go to the next level. I see an arrow coming your way. I can anticipate the attack. you got to have relationships in your life where people who are armor bearers, who are with you, who are on your side, can be in this fight with you together. Because when we're like this in small group, we're protected. We're connected. We're growing. We're better together than we are apart. And let me tell you something. This church is going to be a, a just, just a whole church of warriors who are equipped for the fight with other warriors to their left and right and we're going to go because even in the middle of the night we're not going to die but we are going to fight. Come on somebody give me something right there. Thank you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Hey can you give it up for them? We need other people to look at us. Is there something wrong with you? Oh, you look funny today. There's a lot of days I look funny, and Amanda, Amanda knows. We call it the dungeon. We can see when people are following the enemy. You realize that, right? You can see it. You can see it. you got great discernment. God's already equipped you with that. You know friends who are like, oh, yeah, something's up. These aren't just mood swings. These are spiritual shifts in the wrong direction. And we have to, I'm pleading with you, catch them in our mind so that we can redirect them in our life. Will you all stand with me today? I know there's a lot of people maybe who are in the battle of this thing called life, just trying to survive. And maybe you've been wounded in the fight. Maybe you feel what I'm talking about. And you're like, wow, I have been tracking in the wrong direction for too long. And I, this is what we do. I was blaming it all on God. God, why'd you do this to me? God, why is this happening to me? Why is this going on in my life? God's like, you're the guy who followed the arrows. You're the guy who is listening to the wrong voice. And the, the lie of the enemy is to get us to think that it's always God's fault. You never, I, I never hear anybody blame Satan for all the bad stuff in the world. We, he just gets off scot-free. It's all, oh, God did this and God did that. And God's like, wow, man. Whew. I only just went to the cross, lived, died for you, called myself Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that thing called the serpent that's slithering all around your life that you don't even realize is happening right now is the guy responsible for all that mess. I'm just, I'm 
just ready to give him his. And I'm ready to show a group of people where they should direct their frustration and anger to. You yell at him in the car. You beat the steering wheel. You get into that space and you just, you just, you got to take it up and then take it out on him. It's not God's fault. It's the enemy's fault. And hopefully through this message today, I've equipped and prepared you to the best of my ability to go out and do this starting the moment you leave this facility.